Okay, but let's let's continue focusing actually on our momentum. Now, for this momentum, that's nice, right? But um, suppose we don't know uh, the uh, psi tilde of k. Suppose, so this is, I'm thinking, for the momentum. Suppose we only know psi of x. To get the average of p, we have, there are um, two options then available to you. So the first option would be, um, number one, would be to compute psi tilde of k, right? To get psi tilde, because we need psi tilde for our expression, as the inverse for a transform of psi. Now the problem with that, though, is that we've done these types of Fourier integrals before. They can be a real, um, you know, they can be kind kind of painful to uh, to calculate, right? So we really have uh, uh, we can do this, but this will work, but painful. So we have a, a second option, which is to try to see if we can um, rearrange the expression that we have here, maybe into a more convenient form in terms of the variable that we do have, in terms of psi of x. And I think you can see how I'm going to do that. So the probability expression I had up there was psi tilde h bar k times psi tilde. But what I want you to notice, right, is I've got Parseval's theorem, which is a very powerful theorem because it can turn any expression, any, any bracket expression in the momentum space into a real space representation. So once again, I would define this as some phi tilde function. Then my momentum simply becomes psi inner product with the Fourier transform of phi tilde, inner product with phi. Now, this type of inner product is easy for us to do. We know psi of x. Our only job is now is to figure out phi of x, and then we may have a nice, simpler prescription for um, calculating p. So, what is a phi going to be? So, where phi, right, if we wanted to calculate phi of x, equals, well... It's defined precisely as the Fourier transform of phi tilde. That's how Parseval's theorem works. So this would be the Fourier transform of phi tilde. And phi tilde, we can see, is actually h bar k times psi tilde. So this is the Fourier transform of h bar k times phi tilde, I'm sorry, times psi tilde of k, right? And I know I can do this because this is just how we defined phi tilde of k in the first place. It's just defined to be equal to that. And uh, continuing along the logic, uh, I only have psi of x, so I have to get psi tilde in terms of psi of x. But that's also something I should know how to do, right? We know how to get back our, uh, our weights in our quantum superposition for momentum, it's just the inverse of the Fourier transform, then, of psi of x. So now you can see I've got a complete mathematical procedure for calculating phi of x. So there's a last bit of quantum mechanics notation we need to uh, introduce here. So notice, to calculate my momentum p, I need this phi, and this phi, I now have this very beautiful, nice, explicit mathematical operation, right? A complete procedure, a complete op mathematical operation I need to perform onto psi in order to get the appropriate phi. So in quantum mechanics, we have a more convenient compact notation for this kind of an idea. The way we would write this Right? And I'll put it uh, in quotation marks because this is the first time we're looking at something like this. We would write this as p hat written just before psi of x. And the hat then indicates that this p is something that's called an operator. An operator right, is an object that is a mathematical object that carries out a mathematical operation on whatever function lives here to the right of it.
And you can see then, right, that's what I have here. I have some mathematical operation that acts on psi. This, is, this hat means that's what I'm doing here. It's some mathematical operation applied to psi of x. Great. And the reason why it's called p is because this is the operation used, right, in calculating averages involving the momentum. So it's that simple. So we now have that, um, rewriting this, we're saying phi of x is equal to p hat acting on, is how we say it, psi of x. Or more compactly, we could just say phi is p hat acting on psi. So at the end of the day, then, I see I've got a new way to calculate averages. To calculate the average of the momentum, this would then be the uh, inner product of psi with the momentum operator acting on psi. And I want to put a box around that. Now, notationally, one of the big reasons for writing it, uh, this operator in this form, is I want you to notice that our other formulas all have this the same form. You've got your size and then something written just before the psi that is some mathematical operation. In these cases, it was an easy operation. Just multiply by x or multiply by h bar k. Now, it turns out it's some somewhat more involved operation. Very good. Now. So far, so good. Everything's now nice and well-defined. Everything is carried out in uh, the uh, position representation in terms of psi of x. If you think about it, though, right now, this actually hasn't made things better. It's made things worse. Originally, we said it was painful to calculate psi tilde. That's why we avoided the thing in the first place, because we had to do one of these nasty Fourier transforms. Now, we actually have to do two nasty Fourier transforms. The result is nice and uh, beautiful and works actually quite in general for general operators. But expressed in this form, it's kind of a pain in the neck. The beauty is that oftentimes there are shortcuts for calculating these operators. So let's take a look at what the shortcut might be. Because at the end of the day, right, I don't care how I carry out this mathematical operation. I just want to get the correct answer. So if I can find a quicker way to calculate the, uh, the correct answer, that's just fine. That's just great. So this is going to be a shortcut for um, calculating this um, momentum operation, or this momentum operator. Now, remember the definition. p hat acting on psi of x has to give me back, right, my phi of x, and my phi of x is defined then as the Fourier transform of h bar k acting multiplying psi tilde, right? It's in fact I, I just rewrote exactly the same thing here. Now let's write this out in a little more detail and see if we can do something mathematically with it. So for a transform, we know is we integrate over all possible momenta, we then have our weights h bar k times psi tilde of k. And then times our pure states of momentum, which are e to the i k x. Because after all, this is basically a principle of quantum superposition that I'm using over 2 pi, my pure state of momentum. And now we can take a look at this integral. All right, so I'm going to play now a fairly standard mathematical trick. This is another uh, item in our bag of tricks. And this trick is related to something that are called generating functions. And there's a whole set of tricks like these. And in fact, this is how a Wolfram under the hood actually does a lot of that magic that it does. It uses a lot of what are these called these generating functions. So the way this math trick works is I look at this expression and I say, oh, this looks like just the Fourier transform of psi tilde of k. And I know something about that, right? I know it's psi of x. The thing that's bothering me, though, is this factor of h bar k. And I'd like to get rid of it by generating it through some other mathematical operation. And the way I'm going to do that is as follows. I'm going to write this as integral dk, psi tilde of k, right? I'm going to write the same exact ex uh, uh, expression with the same value, but in a different form. Now, this k, notice, I could get in another way. I could get it without writing it 
by simply taking the derivative of my exponential with respect to k. So let's give that a shot. So I could have then um, d by dk of e to the i k x, and I don't want to forget, of course, I need my 1 over square root of 2 pi. Now, if I had just this, I'd be almost there. This, um, I'm sorry, this is the x derivative. I'd be almost there. When I take the x derivative, I will get an i k to come down here. And that's almost what I want, but I don't want an i k. I want an h bar k. So that's easy enough to handle. I can divide by i to get rid of the i I don't want, and I can multiply by h bar to get back the h bar that I do want. So now you can see these two expressions are now perfectly equal. I've generated one from the other, right, using a slightly different mathematical operation. And the reason, or one of the nice things about this particular mathematical operation, is I can now make some uh, further manipulations of my expression. Look at what we have here, right? This derivative is with respect to x, not with respect to k. Right? So it's not like an integration by parts type of a thing. It's just a derivative with respect to some other variable. So if I think of these as a bunch of functions of x, right? basically I've got a bunch of derivatives of functions of x, and through this integral I'm you know, multiplying them by some, some constants, right? and then summing up over all values of k. Well, that's really in essence a sum of a bunch of derivatives of functions, and we know the sum of derivatives of functions always equals the sum of a bunch of derivatives is always equal to the derivative of the sum. So I can pull this derivative out of my integral and while I'm doing that I may as well also uh, be sure to pull out the h bar on i. I want to pull out those constant factors so I will then have h bar over i which I'm constants I'm pulling out of the integral. The derivative with respect to x I can also pull out of this integral because it's not a derivative with respect to k. I have integral dk psi tilde of k times e to the i k x divided by the square root of 2 pi. Now for the mathematicians out there, that manipulation can be dangerous under certain circumstances, but as long as I always limit myself to what are something called bounded operators, then it's an allowed maneuver. And d by dx is technically not bounded, but you can play the same type of physicist idea by using some kind of uh, integrating factor and truncating things at very high values to keep things bounded. I don't want to get into the details of it, but uh, for, the, um, for the, those who aren't that interested in the detailed mathematical pieces, again, as long as we deal with actual physical functions that can be generated by physical processes in this universe, that maneuver is always uh, available to you. All right, <clears throat> now notice the beauty of this is we recognize this. This is exactly the Fourier transform of psi tilde. It is exactly just psi of x. So we've just learned a very nice uh, shortcut for computing the uh, momentum operator acting on my wave function psi of x, right? That whole nasty mathematical operation from above, right? boils down to this shortcut I could do instead. I could instead just take the x derivative of my wave function and multiply by some constants. So that is this key uh, shortcut. And along with the shortcut for momentum, um, we have a little bit of extra notation that is often used. Sometimes we just like to write, and I'll put it in quotes the first time we do this, the, and say that the, the operator for the momentum, or sometimes called the momentum operator, in the position representation, because this is the operator we use when we're dealing with position wave functions, is just h bar divided by i times d by dx. At first, this may feel a little weird, right? Because it's it, this normally we always write d by dx acting on something, right? So it's kind of strange to see it just hanging out there. But if you were to write this replacement for p hat, 
you see that's what's really going on. And from a mathematical point of view, this is sound because p hat doesn't mean anything by itself. It's an operation, but it has to operate on something. When we put it next to the thing it's operating on, then it becomes clear what I mean by this notation because derivative with respect to x also is just some generic operation. It only becomes clear when it's written next to something. So that's another way I'd like to um, denote this uh, momentum operation. Now, that takes care of uh, momentum. I'd like to just very quickly consider a uh, general case, and then we can uh, think about a new type of observable. So in general, so I'm hoping what you're noticing is that the procedure that I followed for the momentum I could follow actually for any type of an observable. So in general, if I want the average of any observable O, right, we'd already seen that we can write that as the wave function represented in this O representation, our phi bar, right, uh, inner product with O acting on phi bar, right? That was, uh, I believe we had that right up here. Yes, we did. Very good. So we can play a very similar trick. We will want to define this product, right, as a new function, which I will call phi, and it's a function of O, and it's defined exactly as O times the, the quantum weights in the superposition for the observable O that gives us back our um, wave function. Now, the idea is going to be, if we're careful when we construct our representation in terms of O and that quantum principle of superposition, we will construct it in a proper way, as we said, so that Parseval's theorem will work for that observable as well. So this can be rewritten as psi as an inner product with phi. Now in the real space representation or the position representation, where then phi is calculated this phi of x is calculated as some kind of transform. It won't be a Fourier transform, but it simply is the way we construct the uh, wave function out of the pure states that go with my observable. So it's some kind of mathematical procedure that we will have defined. And that procedure, that transformation, is going to be acting on then O, right, times uh, psi bar of O, because this then would be phi bar. Uh, right, that's O psi bar on O. And once again, um, psi bar is something that we will get by doing the inverse of this quantum principle of superposition operation. We'll do the inverse of that operation acting on a generic wave function psi of x, like so. And you can see that, again, all I've done is I've defined some kind of general mathematical operation acting on my wave function in real space. So I will call that an operator. And I name the operator O because it's for calculating averages of O. So that's O acting on psi of x. And when I put the entire expression together, what I think you should see then is that the average of O is going to be the inner product of psi with my phi of x. And my phi of x, as I said, is some kind of operation. It's defined in this way, but we might find good shortcuts for it acting on psi. So we have a nice general expression that would work for any observable.